God used to dwell in a house among his people. But now he has a home that's better than the first. It doesn't look like a building with a steeple. Now he's living in the people of the church. Brick after brick, God is building his temple. Brick after brick, he's making it strong. With Christ the sure foundation and his people as the stones, he is building a place he can live. Brick after brick. Well, good morning, church. We are thankful to be in the house of prayer once again. I want to share a thought with you this morning. It's a familiar story. and We're going to the book of Genesis, the third chapter. I'm reading from the New International Version. And these words are recorded. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? I want to speak this morning from the subject, avoiding snake bites, avoiding snake bites. We're all familiar with the story of Adam and Eve in the garden. And many Bible critics struggle with the story because it sounds something like a fairy tale, some sort of myth, folklore. It really can't be taken literal. It's a primitive concept to try to explain the condition of man, an oversimplification of the complexities of man's sinful condition. And we sometimes even regard it with the touch of embarrassment. We try to flush over it because there's this mystical tree that has some sort of mystery apple, even though the Bible never calls it an apple, has some kind of magical type of fruit. And there's a talking snake. And so we struggle, well, what do we do with this? How do we regard this story? Is it like an old myth? A simple explanation of how we got here? And so critics criticize it and Christians rush over it and try not to spend too much time trying to explain what might be happening here. So I would like this morning to somehow help unpack some of the concepts in this passage to see what we can gather from it. 
I have a lot of information and I will try to be as brief as I, as I can. Uh, I fear that I may go over a little bit. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> but I believe that we, there's some powerful insights that we can glean from this story. So let's start. Now there is a serpent. And right out of the gate, we come to a change of scenery in the Genesis story. Chapter 1 and 2, God creates everything. And he gives a conclusion to all of his work. He says it's good and very good. But we turn the page and we find a serpent. Where did he come from? And what I mean by that, we know that God created him. And we know that God's creation was good. But something happens here. A new character is introduced into the story. And it takes us into a turn. Well, every Sunday school student knows that this, of course, is the devil. And so for the longest time, the serpent has been equated with evil. Even today, we use phrases like, he's a snake in the grass. A serpent is negative. But it's interesting that the symbol of the serpent has not always been something negative. It has not always been something evil. We look through history, Benjamin Franklin used this political cartoon, 1754, displaying a serpent, using it as a call to unite, a call for the colonies to unify and come together. And so the serpent hasn't always been something bad. Serpents have often been symbols and emblems of power, something good. Of course, when we look in Egypt, the serpent is used on the crown of Pharaoh, displaying the Pharaoh's superiority, displaying the power, the divinity of the Pharaoh which gives a whole new insight to the story of Moses where his serpent devours the serpents used by Pharaoh. And the message becomes clear that God is a more superior power than the Pharaoh, than Egypt. We also see that Moses lifts up a brass serpent in the wilderness, at a time when Israel, in their disobedience, was plagued with serpents and bites that caused illness and death. This story is cited in the New Testament. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So here the serpent is used to display something good, healing. This story of the serpent in the wilderness was adopted in our culture today. We see a serpent on a staff in the blue cross and blue shield symbolizing healing, being made whole, healthiness. Even Christians on one point was exalted to be like serpents. Jesus said, behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as a dove. Here Jesus is telling you, be like a serpent when it comes to 
wisdom. Serpents were often equated with wisdom. They believed that that is because everyone knows that snakes shed their skins. And they saw that as a snake rebirthing itself. Not that they couldn't die or be killed, but they would constantly rebirth themselves. And so they thought snakes lived a very long time. And with longevity, it's thought to come wisdom. And so snakes were used as a symbol of wisdom. In the second century, there was a cult, a religious cult known as Gnosticism. And while it was in the second century, its roots were found in the first century during the days of the apostles. Gnosticism was a philosophy and a religion. It was a philosophy because it offered the meaning of life. It was a religion because it offered salvation. The word comes from the Greek gnosis, which means knowledge. We get words such as diagnose, recognize, cognitive from this Greek word gnosis, knowledge. But the knowledge of Gnosticism was not educational knowledge wasn't even intellectual knowledge. It was revealed knowledge. It was intuitive knowledge. It was enlightenment. And so for the Gnostics, everybody doesn't get this. Only special people who pursue this mystical enlightenment and awareness receive this type of superior knowledge. The Gospel of John was written against Gnostic thoughts. If we understood some of the dynamics of Gnosticism, you would see the Gospel of John in entirely different new light. He wrote against the philosophies that the Gnostics propagated. We see it right out the gate. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. A very familiar verse. In the Greek, we understand that this word used is logos which does translate to word. But John is not speaking about the Bible because Logos not only translates to word, but Logos translates to logic. And so what he's saying here is that there was divine logic that started everything. Now again, John is not a Gnostic. But he's using the language of Gnosticism to combat the falseness of Gnosticism. And so it's in the Gospel of John and only in the Gospel of John that we find this story about a snake. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, I bring up the thing about Gnosticism, and it's a very fascinating study. Maybe one day we'll do a seminar on Gnosticism. It's very fascinating. But I bring it up because the Gnostics had their own and many symbols and emblems that they used, and many of them involved snakes, serpents, often intertwined. This was a Gnostic creature known as the Abraxas. You can see that this demigod 
as the head of a rooster and the legs of serpents. Gnostics use snakes, serpents, throughout their doctrines. The idea of a serpent biting its tail would symbolize eternity, eternal truth. So let's go back to our text and we find that there is a serpent. We all know who this is. This is the devil. However, it's interesting to note that nowhere in this chapter is the devil named as being equated with the serpent. In fact, nowhere in Genesis does it say or imply that the serpent is the devil. He's not in this chapter. What does that mean? Is the serpent the devil? Should he be equated with Satan? Well, we do know that the serpent is Satan. But we don't get it from Genesis. We get it from other portions of scriptures, such as Ezekiel 28. Where the prophet speaks to a certain king, but it becomes clear he's not speaking to a human king, but rather the spirit of that king. Ezekiel 28, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, take up a lamentation concerning the king of Tyre and say to him, this is what the sovereign law says. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you. So now we know that this creature was the one in the garden. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, that's an angel. For so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. So now we know that it was in fact Lucifer, Satan, who was there in that garden. But we didn't get it from Genesis. In the book of Revelation, the 12th chapter, verse 9, the great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. So, we do know that it was Satan in the garden, but we don't get it from Genesis. There's a story of Jesus and his apostles at one point. We find it in the Gospel of Luke. This is just before Jesus goes to be crucified in Jerusalem. And read what happens here. Now it came to pass when the time had come for him, Jesus, to be received up, that's crucified, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, the apostle of love, James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? You hear what he's saying? You want us to kill them? Just give the word. We'll take them out. Just like Elijah, they're even using some Bible. But he turned and rebuked them 
and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. The lesson in Genesis, in the apparent absence of Satan, it is foolish and dangerous to assume that the devil is always recognizable and easy to see. We don't always recognize Satan. We may like to think that we'll be able to spot him the minute he comes into the room. But that would be a mistake. We know that, as Revelation tells us, the serpent is, in fact, the devil. But it also tells us not only who he is, but what he's about. Who deceives the whole world. So this is Satan's purpose, to deceive you, to pull you away from God. Peter would say, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So we know who the serpent is, and we know why he's there. Now, as we go on in the story, the next thing we may note is, is the woman. And many have taken this passage as a lesson and an exhortation about women. I've often heard that this here explains why women are supposed to be obedient and subject to their husbands. I didn't say it. I'm just telling you what. I said, that's where this, this is what this is about. This is why women can't be pastors. And so they go to this to put forth that idea that women are in trouble because of this God and scene. Now, we can discuss and debate those points of doctrines, but we should not think that that's what this story is about. Because Eve here represents all of us. Eve represents that part of you that's vulnerable to the voice of the devil. Eve is that part of all of us that can easily be persuaded away from God. And so Paul warns, therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. So we have the woman. The next portion we find that might cause us pause is he said to the woman. So now we have a serpent that talks. What is that about? Could that be real? Well, you would notice that Eve is not startled that the serpent is talking. This is not astounding to Eve. It is believed that before the fall of man, all the animals spoke. There's an ancient book called the Book of Jubilees. It's not scripture, but it records some of the history of the scriptures. And the Book of Jubilees speaks about the fall of man and the garden with Adam and Eve. And it says that at one time, all the animals did speak. And on that day was closed the mouth of all beasts and of cattle and of birds, and of whatever walks, and of whatever moves, so that they could no longer speak. For they had all spoken one with another, with one lip, and with one tongue. 
So this may be why Eve is not surprised to hear the serpent speaking. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. Crafty. Crafty means cunning. Crafty means devious. Crafty means slick. Now, the book of Job, in the debate with Job and his friends, as they accuse Job of messing up, they cry out to him, but you are doing away with the fear of God and hindering meditation before God. Your iniquity teaches your mouth and you choose the tongue of the crafty. Your own words condemn you and not I. Your own lips testify against you. Job, you're using the tongue of the crafty. Craftiness can be conveyed through language, through conversation. And that's what we see here. He says to the woman, the serpent speaks to the woman with craftiness. And what does he talk about? Did God really say? He doesn't come to Eve and ask her, How'd you vote in the last election? What are your views about the latest conspiracy theories? No, let's talk about God. Why does he do that? Does he share the passion of Eve with God? No, we know that he's trying to pull her away from God. He's trying to pull her far from God. But he's using the conversation of God. Let's talk about God. Let's lay some common ground. A shared understanding. And he raises the question, did God really say? And that's the essence of much of temptation. Getting you to doubt what God really says. Well, what did God say here? Go to the second chapter. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So here we have the commandment and what is raised? He raises doubt. Is it true that you're not allowed to eat? Actually, God says you're free to eat. But Satan comes in with the twist, going through the back door, raising the doubt. He really doesn't want you to eat this stuff. Raising the negative. You're not allowed to do this, are you? The Bible talks about the fallacy of adding or taking away from the word of God. We see it in Revelation. In Revelation, he's talking about the book of Revelation. But the principle is clear in regards to all scripture. Moses says, see that you do all I command you. Do not add to it or take away from it. What we see in the garden is both mistakes made. Adding to the word and taking away from the word. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. That's true. He said that. But God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. Now, God didn't say you couldn't touch it. He said you can't eat it. Well, what's the big deal about that? Well, what would Eve have to do before she ate it? She would have to touch it. 
If she touches it and sees I'm not dying, maybe, just maybe, I can eat it and not die. So she adds to the word of God. Satan comes and he takes away from the word of God. God says you will certainly die. He says you will not certainly die. You're not really going to die. That's not what he meant. And then he comes with the accusation. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. What is he doing here? He's pointing the finger. He's accusing God. You see, God really doesn't have your best interests in mind. He's trying to keep something back from you. He doesn't want you to have. He's not thinking about you. He's trying to hold you back. And that's the accusation. What comes next is rationalization. We're going to justify. Is there a way for me to do this and be okay? She saw that it was good for food. Well, I got to eat. So this can't be that bad. The second thing that's pleasing to the eye. It's good to look at. It's not too bad. It's not all that bad. And that it's desirable for gaining wisdom. This is good for me. I could use this. This can make me better. And so she bargains with herself and finds excuses and reasons to disobey God. James says, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away from his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Proverbs tells us there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Now there's one more interesting point to this Genesis story. If we look at Genesis 2, we find that God is identified all through that chapter as the Lord God. Over 10 times throughout the entire chapter, he is the Lord God. Even in the commandment, the commandment that's in question, and the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. When we get to chapter 3, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He, the serpent, said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. They refer to God as God, not the Lord God. They don't see him as the Lord God. He is simply God to them. Well, what does that mean? Because God is what's used to describe the supreme being, the creator. We acknowledge that he created us. But Lord refers to master and king. So they can't deny that he's God, but they're not calling him Lord. Jesus makes it clear, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? 
Eve and the devil don't acknowledge God as Lord because they're not listening to him anymore. They're not obeying him anymore. It's just like today. There are people that believe in God. Yes, I believe God is real. I believe he created us. I even believe he loves us. But the real question, is he your Lord? Would you say yes to his will? Would you say yes to the things that don't set well with you? So here we see the story of the serpent. But it's in this story that we also find the first messianic promise that Jesus will come and fix this. I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman, and between your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Now we go back to that story in the wilderness, that somewhat perplexing verse, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Here, Jesus is identified with a serpent, with something that is regarded as evil, as sinful. Why would Jesus use this to point to him? It's because we have to understand what happened on the cross. God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus didn't just bear your sin. He became your sin. Paul would say, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. As it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. When we look back and examine and realize what Jesus actually did on the cross, he became that evil. He became that sin. He became my sin. And he paid that price. But when he got up from that grave and he proclaimed, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys to hell and death. He has defeated the serpent. And because he has defeated Satan and defeated the serpent and defeated all evil, he then turns around. And says, behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of evil. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is your victory? What Jesus did on the cross was he transferred that power after taking on the serpent, becoming the serpent, becoming the evil. He now passes it on to us. That's why we can say greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. It's because he became the serpent and got victory over that. He has given me power to resist temptation. He has given me power to overcome the evil one and all the joy that came to me when I knew that I was free when he broke my chains and he set me free and he put a song in my heart amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me he brought me out and he turned me around thank God I have power over Satan thank 
Thank God sin can't bring me down. Thank God no demon in hell can turn me around. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. He set me free. He set me free. He set me free. Break out the brick. God is building his temples. Break out the brick. He is making it strong. With Christ the sure foundation and his